Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. Today is the fourth Sunday of Easter, the third Sunday that's after the octave of Easter. It's all, they all have funny names like that. It's also the World Day of Prayer for Vocations, mostly because the gospel has to do with the Good Shepherd and all of that. We'll get to that in a minute. As we always do, let's begin with our prayer. Regina Celi, letare, alleluia. Qui aque meruisti portare, alleluia. Resurrexit sicut dixit, alleluia. Ora pro nobis Deum, alleluia. Rejoice and be glad, O Virgin Mary, alleluia, for the Lord has truly risen, alleluia. Let us pray. O God, who gave joy to the world through the resurrection of thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, grant, we beseech thee, that through the intercession of the Virgin Mary, his mother, we may obtain the joys of everlasting life. Through the same Christ, our Lord. Amen. Good times. Yesterday was confirmation. It was a lot in the sense that it was a lot of, a lot of things to do, lots of things to enjoy, and lots of fun to have, and all the rest of that. We'll have photos, of course, very, very soon that, you know, expect them tomorrow, I'd say. And it really, I hope, will be a lovely thing to enjoy for everyone who wasn't there. For everyone who was there, it felt a lot like Easter Sunday in the morning. It was absolutely jam-packed and really, really pleasant. All right. Anyway, let's move on to today. Oh, and by the way, how's the weather today? The weather's beautiful. It's, it's springtime and sunny and actually kind of warm. Who would have thought? <laughs> anyway, let's dig in. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, lead us to a share in the joys of heaven, so that the humble flock may reach where the brave shepherd has gone before. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and proclaimed, Let the whole house of Israel know for certain that God has made both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they asked Peter and the other apostles, What are we to do, my brothers? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is made to you and to your children, and to all those far off, whomever the Lord our God will call. He testified with many other arguments and was exhorting them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 persons were added that day. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In verdant pastures, he gives me repose. Beside restful waters, he leads me, he refreshes my soul. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. He guides me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk in the dark valley, I fear no evil for you are at my side. With your rod and your staff that give me courage. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. You spread the table before me in the sight of my foes. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. Only goodness and kindness follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for years to come. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. A reading from the first letter of St. Peter. Beloved, if you are patient when you suffer for doing what is good, this is a grace before God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. 
He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was insulted, he returned no insult. When he suffered, he did not threaten. Instead, he handed himself over to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body upon the cross so that, free from sin, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you have gone astray like sheep, but you have now returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. I am the good shepherd, says the Lord. I know my sheep and mine know me. Alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever does not Whoever does not enter a sheepfold through the gate, but climbs over elsewhere, is a thief and a robber. But whoever enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens it for him, and the sheep hear his voice. As the shepherd calls his own sheep by name and leads them out, when he has driven out all his own, he walks ahead of them, and the sheep follow him, because they recognize his voice but they will not follow a stranger. They will run away from him because they do not recognize the voice of strangers. Although Jesus used this figure of speech, the Pharisees did not realize what he was trying to tell them. So Jesus said again, Amen, Amen, I say to you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and slaughter and destroy. I came so that they might have life and have it more abundantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The phrase <clears throat> that Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. He says that too, but just not in these verses. Four more verses and you get there. But this interesting thing about the gate, that's a very strange kind of analogy. So if the first part doesn't make a lot of sense when he's talking about the sheepfold and the gate and you know going in and out and all that stuff, and then the gospel says, but the Pharisees didn't understand what he was saying, so we tried again. It's fine. Don't feel bad. You're not one of the Pharisees. But it is a kind of complicated image that the Lord is using here. Specifically, a door. We don't usually think of doors as doing much other than we go in, we go out, we close the door, we like we deal with it. It's just a part of the world in which we live of structures. There are buildings in our world. Okay. But the way that Jesus is using it is in such a way that those who go in and go out by the gate are being formed by it. They're, they're being changed by it. They're the ones who have the ability to go in and out by the gate. And the gate is important because he is saying, I am the gate, which is, again, a kind of a strange thing to say. And just in case anyone reading this little bit here in the Gospel of John might be wondering, maybe that's not really what it says. No, that's really what it says. In fact, Jesus makes a point of repeating himself, I am the gate making sure it's really clear, okay, which is funny, again, because in just a few verses, he's going to say, I am the good shepherd. There's a connection, though, that he's trying to make between the gate and specifically the shepherds, not just the sheep as well, and when it comes to all of this, of course, we're talking about the folk, the people, this group who is the flock. The shepherds are important, and so for that reason, we have on this Sunday, the World Day of Prayer for vocations. Obviously, vocations are many, and they're very important. But being honest, whenever someone starts talking about vocations, they're usually talking about vocations to the priesthood. That being said, the vocation to holy matrimony is a wonderful vocation. The vocation to the consecrated life in general, all kinds of ways to consecrate life, is very important and very good. 
But the reason why we hear the most about the priesthood is because there's a very, very simple connection. The priest is connected to the Eucharist, is connected to the church, is connected to salvation, in the sense that if there is no priest, then there is no Eucharist, then there is no church, and that rest of it doesn't work out either. I mean, it's, it's, I don't mean to be very, very desperate with that, but that's also kind of how that works and why it's so important to constantly pray for vocations. So there are lots of ways in which we can pray for vocations. Praying for vocations is very good. In fact, this Sunday is the 60th World Day of Prayer for Vocations. We've been doing it for a bit. But it's also, if we look back at the last 60 years, we, we see a kind of not necessarily good kind of data happening in, in a lot of places. But let's look at the Diocese of Salt Lake City in particular. So here we are in the Diocese of Salt Lake City, which is coextensive of the state of Utah. You know, that thing which is the church in Utah. And looking at the Catholics and how many priests there are and how these things exist, the number of Catholics has grown tremendously. So if we look at, for example, 1966, which is a number that I have right in front of me, that you can have also, it's out there. It's, it's not that hard to find. There were, at that time, according to our numbers, about 52,000 Catholics. Today, there are about 320,000 Catholics. Okay, cool. In 1966, there were a total number of 104 priests hanging out in this diocese, about 60 diocesan priests, but also 40 some religious priests, which means that the Catholics per priest in 1966 was 490, which is, you know, that's a good group of folk around. Today, we have about 57 priests. Uh, some of whom are retired, but still the same number of diocesan priests, more or less, and no religious priests. I mean, except for the Dominicans who are hanging out there, but that's, again, okay, so three, okay. And then, so we have uh, Catholics per priest of about 5,600. So from about 490 to 5,600. That ratio has literally gotten decimated. And that's not necessarily a great thing because the church has grown. We grow, we grow a lot. Again, that number of Catholics is a huge increase. We have also at the same time, a great increase in the number of parishes to say nothing of missions as well as say other little places where we have communities of folk and they gather and it's, it's a church, it's, it's the Catholic church. The <clears throat> kind of the bottom line of this is it's worth reminding folk that we are hiring. We want to get more folk interested in this. It's, and it's not even just like a, a really kind of pragmatic self-serving thing. It's really not. But it's also a real vocation and it is out there. It is very good to pray for vocations. But there's also the other half of this, which is it's really important to encourage young folk to consider a life that is consecrated in some way. Not just the consecrated life in general, of which there are also priests. Notice that particular category is kind of missing in the, in the, in the data that's on the website. But the uh, diocesan priests, the priests who are of the particular place, who are in the parishes, who are in most ways the ones that parishioners see and have interaction with because that's how the church works. If anything, the analogy that the Lord is using in the gospel of like the flock isn't about the big flock, but rather just the flock, literal flock of there are sheep and there is a shepherd and there is a, a bond of love and the sheep trust the shepherd and all of those things. And we can use those same kinds of ideas to apply that to the way which a Catholic community exists around a parish and so on. Incidentally, this is um, one of the reasons why doors are so important in churches. It's not just a pragmatic structure. It's also a very intensely Christ structure. So the door is kind of 
really important. So the, usually the door is rather decorated in some way, hopefully. Um, for example, here at St. Mary's, there's a marvelous stained glass window that's right above the door. It's really pretty. The doors themselves are rather nice, but it makes it like the door is kind of special. Occasionally people wonder like, where is the front door? It's like, see the big door over there? That's a door. <laughs> Anyway, but that's a different kind of um, discussion. In old fancy churches of the past, think of your typical kind of Gothic structure. Usually there's a door and then above it, there's some kind of carving that indicates something kind of cool, like the whole church or like heaven or something that is meant to be representative of the existence of the church in relationship to Christ and all of it being the same thing, and the door does it. Anyway, you may have noticed that in your travels and seen around in pictures and so on, but the door matters. And so all of these things are talking about just this one reality. But getting back to this uh, prayer for vocations, this world day of prayer for vocations, like I say, that's just one half. The other half is actually encouraging folk, specifically, say, young men, to take the idea of vocation very seriously, or at least somewhat seriously, or at least somewhat. <laughs> it only happens when you invite them. They're not gonna think about it on their own necessarily, unless they're really precocious. But most people, you know, they need a little bit of a, hey, have you considered this? Or maybe you should consider this, or you should consider this, or you should really consider this, or you need to talk to someone about this, this is good. This is something, a quality than you that we see, and this is like a worthwhile thing. It takes a little bit of encouragement because otherwise, how is there a connection? You don't usually, I mean, in someone's normal daily life, it's not obvious that, hey, we're hiring. There's not like a form you fill out. Actually, there are a couple websites <laughs> that uh, exist. Like there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's this one like, quiz website which is very very fun it's uh 20 questions and you get points based on each and then you get a score at the end <laughs> it's really kind of funny but again that's that's kind of a gimmick right we're talking about someone's life here the gimmick is is fun and enjoyable for a moment but really it requires that you know it's a motion of love kind of thing it requires the human experience and relationship and an invitation, an encouragement, a lot of encouragement. Because otherwise, how is Jesus, who is the gate, going to form them into the shepherd? Going in and out of the gate, like with the rest of the flock, okay, that forms, but the shepherd has this other characteristic as the leader. It's not entirely obvious how there's a transformation there in the, in, in the analogy that Jesus is using, which he is trying to make more clear because the Pharisees can't understand it. But there's also this other thing, which is, but it happens. <laughs> so how do we do that? Well, we have to actually give that encouragement, that human heart. Because ultimately, regardless of whether we're talking about the gospel today or any other Sunday, regardless of whether we are meeting in person, online, or however. The priest has a very particular relationship to the church, such that its existence depends on it. The church is altogether just one. There is, remember the thinking about how we have of the body of Christ, it's just one. Christ is the head. We are its members. But the body can't live without its members. Some of them are quite vital, you know, like a heart. <laughs> and so on, and so on. And that really does check out because the priest and the Eucharist and the church and therefore salvation all depend on each other for existence. And this is something that is very important to us. So the numbers aren't meant to be scary, but they, they are you know, difficult. Here's another little factlet. In just a month and a half, we're ordaining two priests and a deacon, but we're ordaining two priests. But this will mean that the number of seminaries that we have will decrease by two 
increase by one because we have a seminarian who's going in this year, who's our friend, Michael, and that's great. But the number of seminarians who are to be priests net is going down. And it's not a large number to begin with. We have to always be doing this. We have to always be not just praying for vocations, but actively encouraging. Here at St. Mary's, this is something that we take very seriously and is very, very important. And for which I'm tremendously proud we should all be as a community. Over the last five years, we've had one man go into seminary. He's doing great. It's Brian who comes on coffee sometimes. We have another one who's about to go into seminary. This is great. We have been hosting the seminarians in pastoral years, like our friend Anthony. This is great. And we're doing all of these things because it matters. Frankly, if you know anyone else who's like, you know, producing seminarians at such a rate and so on, please let me know because we, we should talk because it's a fun kind of club to be in. And that's nice. And, and we should pat ourselves on the back for that. But more importantly, comes this other idea, which is, yeah, the shepherds need to be. And the Lord wants to form them. And this is very much the work of God. And all of these things put together, it's not just for the sake of, you know, a gold star here or there, but really because it matters, because the people need to hear the voice of the shepherd. And it's not just the one guy who happens to be doing it. Remember, just a couple of verses later, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Jesus is. The voice of Jesus must be heard. And this is how we do it. Anyway, it's the World Day of Prayer for Vocations. So pray for vocations, but also encourage those young men to actually consider it because that's the step that needs to be taken. As we always do, let's bring our prayers together now and offer them to the Lord that he will hear and answer us. For our Holy Father, Pope Francis, for our Bishop Oscar, and for all bishops, that they may be bridges leading to the Lord's divine grace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For people experiencing homelessness, that they will discover the unconditional love found in Christ Jesus. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For policymakers, that they may soften their hearts toward people who are helpless. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Utahns, that during our transition to spring, we give thanks to God for all of his creation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our diocese, as we continue with the Eucharistic revival, may we all be healed, converted, formed, and unified by an encounter with Jesus in the Eucharist. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Gathering all our prayers into one, let us offer them in the words our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who willed to provide shepherds for your people, pour out in your church a spirit of piety and fortitude to raise up worthy ministers for your altars and make them ardent yet gentle heralds of your gospel. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down on you and remain with you forever. Amen. Happy Sunday. Hey, coming up this week, again, we're not going to have coffee on Saturday because it's First Communion Day. This is the uh, sacraments extravaganza time of year. Next week is First Communion, so again, no coffee. FYI. Let's keep praying. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, the eyes of mercy toward us. And after this, our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. O God, our refuge and our strength, 
Look down in mercy on your people who cry to you. And by the intercession of the glorious and immaculate Virgin Mary, Mother of God, of Saint Joseph, her spouse, of your blessed apostles, Peter and Paul, and of all the saints, in mercy and goodness, hear our prayers for the conversion of sinners and for the liberty and exaltation of our Holy Mother and Church. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Saint Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Fantastic. Everyone have a lovely Sunday, a really warm and suddenly summery day. All right. And also, hey, tomorrow, May 1st, St. Joseph the Worker is a lovely feast day too. A little tiny one, but a fun one because, hey, it's May. All right. God bless you all and see you tomorrow. All right. Bye-bye.